when I was studying at a lower level, I did have parts of the, my curriculum changed, which was quite cool. <laughs> I, ma- I managed to influence some positive change in that respect. In terms you know, sometimes of, that's all it takes is just one person to say, hey, look, this, is, this might not be right. We might be looking at this from the wrong angle. You know, look at it from this angle. And then it, it becomes really difficult to deny when you've been shown the, the limits of epidemiology, right? Like the, when you get shown, okay, look, yes, some of these organizations, the World Health Organization, uh, the, the American Heart Association, yes, some of these people have demonized saturated fat. And they've laid out a case to say that, oh, look, this is bad. Saturated fat, animal foods are bad. Um, but when you really look at how this data was, um, was analyzed, how the data was collected, when you look at nutritional epidemiology, population studies, um, you know, observational studies, you see that there is a big gap, right? That we're really not looking at hard science. We're really not looking at something that's really been fleshed out and experimented uh, with uh, um, and it's you know becomes abundantly clear that we don't know what we think we know about nutrition, especially in like the orthodoxy position in the West uh, and Western medicine. It's not it's not so cut and dry. Animal foods bad, saturated fat bad, uh, meat bad, and oh look, anything that's made of plants is good. Therefore, the you know the Beyond Burger, which is made of canola oil and like uh, pea protein isolate and methyl cellulose, bamboo powder, you know, I mean, that, that's somehow healthy just because it's plant-based is, is a ridiculous notion. And I think a lot of, um, a lot, I mean, a lot of really intelligent people do get duped, right? We want to believe the authorities or, you mm-hmm. know, our, our professors, we think they should be correct. And, um, you know, I mean, any of us can get duped. And I think the, uh, the nutrition aspect of, uh, the nutritional policy, nutritional science, this stuff has been highly, it's been very politicized. And by politicized, I don't mean like in a, uh, you know, false left, right way. I mean, it politicizes that uh, as in it's a, it's a way for huge corporations, um, pharmaceutical companies, big agricultural conglomerates, seed companies, uh, petrochemical companies to make a lot of money. Um, and sell us foods and even legislate and mandate um, policies that will force more people to eat these foods that are nutritionally deficient, that are nutritionally inferior to locally produced animal foods um, that are actually really beneficial for the environment as well. So we're looking at something that is, uh, that's getting pushed really hard now. And I think nutritional science and uh, nutritional policy are going to become even more politicized at a global scale. As we see people pushing for planetary dietary guidelines, we see a lot of these big NGOs who want um, you know, plant-based dietary guidelines globally to influence through governments what gets subsidized, what gets taxed, and what gets uh, you know demonized and what gets promoted through um, uh, big money interests that are you know, ultimately leveraged by big international financial, uh, big international financiers, NGOs, uh, huge corporations, and this is not uh, this is not to our benefit. What we're seeing being pushed out with the uh, the plant based agenda, the plant based narrative, it's hurting our health. It's already harmed our health dramatically, especially when you look at the disease rates in the West, disease rates in the United States, where the diet has gone towards plant based over the last few decades. We're eating more seed oils, more processed refined grains, more processed plant foods, and it's been devastating for our health. It's been absolutely devastating for our health, and um, and devastating for rural people as well. You know, I mean, a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, our generation, they we're being influenced to move into crowded cities. You know, we, we seek, um, you know, most millennials are seeking a urban lifestyle. They want to, you know, make it in the, the tech business, you know, looking at the, the startup business in California is really big Silicon Valley, the area where I came out of Northern California, uh, you know, all the money there is, you know, big tech, big data. And, you know, this is this movement to push the plant-based diet, to push plant-based dietary guidelines is further empowering big ag 
um, further empowering massive industrialization of food production. And the more disconnected we get as the generations pass by from the production of food, the easier it's going to be for these industrial um, giants to just continue feeding us this kibble, this slop, and uh, have, have be, be praised for it. You know, people are praising Bill Gates and the Beyond Burger as you know some great alternative that's going to lower greenhouse gas emissions while making us more healthy because it's not real meat; it's made out of plants, so therefore it's healthy. And both of these are hogwash, right? Both of these are nonsense. You know, the, the monocropping, the destruction of soil that comes with industrial agriculture, these are major issues that we're dealing with now and that we're going to deal with in the future with food so, uh, shortages, with a high fragility, um, with a very fragile system of food production that's consolidated, consolidated and vertically integrated. Um, the problems are manifesting more and more in our health, in our uh, fragile food production system and in the environmental factors that um, that are contributing to our health, right? Pollution is a real thing, right? There is pollution. There is a lot of pollution from chemical companies, from Monsanto, from these uh, petrochemical companies that are uh, generating loads of profits as they sell us pharmaceutical drugs to deal with the uh, the degrading of our health from you know, the, the low quality food that we're eating that's drenched in agricultural chemicals, insecticides, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides. And you know, it's, it's a, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, that's a, that's a long rant, but it's, it's something that we, we all do need to look at. And this is not, it's not so simple as plant-based is good, meat is bad. Um, th there's a heck of a lot more going on here. And animal foods are absolutely crucial. I think it's fascinating. Your case like dealing, dealing with a very aggressive brain tumor, dealing with a very, very uh, uh, fragile system, you are able to regenerate your health so effectively using a straight up animal-based animal -based diet. And this flies right in the face of the narrative of meat is bad, animal foods are bad. You're eating exclusively animal foods and you're getting your life back. And I wish, uh, I'm really glad you're doing what you're doing. You're able to help people and, and show people what's happened in your life. Because I think our generation, like the millennials and then the, the, the Zoomers and the uh, Gen Z, we're under heavy attack through marketing campaigns, through global PR campaigns that are pushing these ideas that this is somehow progress, that this is somehow good, that this is somehow helping society, the planet, and uh, you know inequality or whatever is going to frame it, that we, uh, you know, us eating mass produced kibble is somehow this beautiful revolutionary act that's going to uh stop all suffering and um yeah yeah the animal foods have really been important for you to kind of alleviate some of the suffering that you've that you've gone through and it's cool to see like just how much you've grown i mean i can see more you have more muscle mass you have like your like your face there's more muscle in your face uh more symmetry in your face as well like you can just see how healthy you're getting from this and um no, it's undeniable. So, yeah, dude, sorry, that was a really long rant. <laughs> no, it's good. Yeah, I'm uh, sleeping a lot better too, so that's probably affecting me in a positive way. Do you think um, the exercise helps with the sleep? Probably, but also just optimizing my light environment and getting close to nature. Because today's a day off for me, so I've been outside most of the day. Um, nice. You mentioned the World Health Organization and yeah. their new new. I don't know if it's a new stance on red meat, but they're claiming that red meat causes cancer. Do you have you looked into how they came to that conclusion? Yeah, well, I mean, it was largely staffed by vegetarians, right? So the uh, the, the council that came up with this uh, this study. Do you remember what the study was called? The red meat is a likely carcinogen. No, but just it's been promoted by all of, or it's been backed by all of these cancer yes. research uh, organizations. Just saying I mean, this should. is another one of these cases where it is weak epidemiology. They're looking at surveys where, you know, they, they go door to door and they ask standard Americans, how many cups of ribs do you have every day? How many cups of ice cream do you eat every day? How many cups of sugar do you eat in, uh, in a month? You know, weird questions like this where it's very hard to quantify. And um, yeah, a lot of the... Uh, a lot of the dietary studies that we see being done, a lot of the stuff that we see demonizing red meat, demonizing what they they said red and processed meats, right? Which is 
what does that even mean? Like is, is ground beef processed meat? Ground beef is, uh, you know, a, a cured ham with, that's not even using any nitrates or anything from a local producer. Is that processed meat? I mean, a lot of this, it, it, I'm not really sure how they're actually uh, classifying this, but um, somebody that did a really good write-up on this, I think uh, Nina Teicholz has done some good work looking at, she's a journalist who's looked at a, a lot of the, uh, the uh, sketchy nature of some of these nutritional recommendations and some of the, uh, some of these big organizations. But yeah, it, the saying red meat causes cancer is absolute nonsense. It's like saying drinking water causes cancer, right? It's like, you know, everybody who has cancer, they all drink water, you know? So therefore it, it, it just must've been this water. Look at the, the presence of this water must've been giving these people cancer. There's so many things that we know and you've looked into this as well. I mean, you've got so many of these chemicals that we get exposed to regularly. I think you mentioned in the past, uh, what is it? Vi vinyl chloride. Is that yeah. what it was? Called? That has a strong link with brain cancer. Right. In particular. And where's that? Where, where is that found? Uh, so in production of construction materials and plastics. So everywhere in our house is like, right? Like this <laughs> computer that I'm on, you know, probably made with it. Um, well, it's it's when you get the the kind of fumes from it, like new cars. Yeah, you get into a new house and you. Smell or it. if there's uh, roads being laid and you have the the wet tarmac and you, you get fumes from that, that can cause these uh -huh. brain and lung tumors. My, oh, man, my, I remember when they when they laid out the roads in the suburbs where I lived as a kid, that they laid like a fresh thing. The, the whole area smelled like that for yeah. a couple weeks if you look up uh mccullum lake brain cancer cluster you can see there's this small area in the u.s where it's just about the whole town immediately developed these glioblastoma brain tumors and <sighs> dow chemical was fined a few billion dollars to just settle the cases it's yeah, crazy. see, like it's these companies like Dow, like Syngenta, like Monsanto, Bayer, you know, these companies all get a free pass as these, uh, you know, global um, agencies demonize carbon dioxide, which is what you exhale, which is what plants inhale. This gets demonized. We get told that that's the reason that that's the only pollutant uh, that we should worry about. And uh, red meat's causing cancer, right? We know why everyone's getting cancer. It's red meat, which we eat less red meat now in the United States per person less red meat is consumed now than ever in the past. And people are eating more chicken. People are eating more of this, you know, Tyson foods, mass produced um, chicken stuff. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's really backwards, right? So Dow ends up, they settled. You said they settled, they paid, they paid out. Yeah. I think it was about 9 billion or something. <laughs> you can look it up. It's, it's an interesting case. The, the residents actually made a documentary film on it just so they could be listened and it gained traction and then eventually they won this settlement and Dow Chemical just paid out this huge sum of money. To have uh, an actual clus cancer cluster where there's so many people diagnosed, you can't ignore that because if it's just individual cases, they can say, oh, well, it's just coincidence. Like yeah. with some of these glyphosate in in um, incidences. Yeah, we've also got the glyphosate and autism connection, which is really similar as far as the cancer clusters. You have these clusters where autism rates are really high near pesticides, uh, near, near uh, fields where there's heavy pesticide use. And you know, I mean, it's, it, it's abundantly clear to the people in those areas what's going on. But of course, this is something that these companies can obscure legally, right? They're able to skirt um, reality by having really good lawyers, right? By knowing how to frame it, by knowing... Uh, knowing when to settle out of court, <laughs> like Dow. <clears throat> so it's, um, yeah, it's a shame. We get told red meat's bad. And then these other issues, like, you know, the vinyl chloride issue, these cancer clusters, clusters where uh, these big chemical companies like Dow, like Monsanto, like Bayer, are complicit in the death and, uh, you know, the destruction of the health of loads of people but there's no repercussions for them, right? We just, we're, we're being led to focus on a lot of the wrong issues. We're focusing on, um, 
you know, fake boogeyman like saturated fat and cholesterol, right? Whereas cholesterol is every single cell of our body needs cholesterol. Every our, our brain uh, contains tons of cholesterol. Cholesterol is ubiquitous. Our body's creating it uh, constantly. That gets demonized. We get told that you know cholesterol is terrible, but then we don't look at uh, you know seed oils and how you know the effect of the effects of heavy pesticide exposure through foods. The effects of pesticides such as atrazine, which have effects, gonadal effects on animals, you know, creating uh, you know, uh, hormonal disruptions. A lot of these chemicals that we're exposed to regularly through plastics are major hormone disruptors. And we're looking at a lot of, uh, you know, everybody knows about BPA now, but there are a ton of other plastic derived com uh, plastic uh, compounds that are toxic to us that create similar situations that are phytoestrogens, pseudoestrogens. And yeah, I think it's a shame that we're not looking at more at some of these things. Uh, but it's, it's understandable why, right? And you know, anybody who's been to a university understands that studies have to get funded, right? These studies have to be funded. And where does the big funding for the university that I went to come from? It's coming from the military. It's coming from big tech. It's coming from big pharma. It's coming from big ag. Like that's, that's where the money comes from. And unfortunately, um, you've kind of got the fox guard in the hen house in a lot of ways um, with nutrition policy. And it doesn't benefit us, but it does benefit, you know, these huge transnational corporations and banks that are, uh, that are pushing this stuff. Yeah. And in terms of the cancer stuff, the ketogenic diet studies are funded by, or in, at least in part by Nestle. Because Nestle produce this? Nestle produce a product called KetoCal, and <laughs> KetoCal is this ketogenic product that's given to children with drug resistant epilepsy. It's kind of like yeah. a powder. It's kind of like a meal replacement uh, yeah. shake that you can create. That's is it exogenous ketones? Are there ketones in it? No, it's just a high fat um, formulation. It's a four to one um, product, so it's four parts fat to one part um carbs and protein and okay yeah it's <laughs> it's it's this product that is given to these young children um to get them into nutritional ketosis and it works but it's just the most horrible ingredients in there you could imagine it's got uh soy protein and all these inflammatory <laughs> all the filler, fats yeah. yeah all these oh, vegetable man. oils and it it works in that it it changes their metabolism to the point where they aren't having seizures anymore because yeah. these children have genetic disorders whereby the glucose transporters in the brain are dysfunctional. So yeah, yeah it will stop them having seizures, but it's it makes them have all these other health problems because it's just so unhealthy. And this is what's it's given absurd. to the this is what's given to the rodents in these ketogenic diet studies um and they're still getting good results despite all this other crap in there that we know is damaging you know soy yeah isolate. and I, i've often wondered about that i've thought how how is that even possible that they have these <laughs> positive results um but rodents are very different to humans so i have seen yeah. that there are other uh ketogenic studies uh, on humans where they've had just these horrible ketogenic diets that have all these yeah. um soy proteins and pro-inflammatory seed oils yeah, and vegetable oils and stuff yeah it's, it's and, and, the, oil. and the cancers get worse and then you have people pointing to these studies saying aha ketogenic diet doesn't work and it's it makes things yeah. worse rather than better and there are all these really badly um just uh ba badly put together well, it seems like study engineering is, you know, it's, it's like an, uh, it's an unspoken art, the engineering of the results you want through carefully crafting the study, through carefully selecting the research team and institution that conducts the study, and through crafting the methodology of the study. So it's not, it's not like, you know, you and I, who looked at loads of studies, who've looked at this stuff, I mean, you, you know that if you were a dishonest person, you could go out there and prove what you wanted with carefully craftily designed uh, studies. But um, obviously that's not what you want to do. Fortunately, there are, there are people who kind of, you know, they'll take a little far, you know, there's uh, 
there's a lot of padding of research that goes on and it's not uh yeah it's it's, it's not easy to dig through this stuff i think on fortunately and unfortunately for you you had to live it <laughs> right so it's like you you lived through um this situation and you've used these tools and you've experimented on yourself and learned a lot um which is i don't know i always love connecting with you and kind of i really value your perspective and opinion on a lot of these things and it's uh i didn't know this about the nestle uh involvement in some of the keto studies it's really interesting yeah, they have the product called KetoCal. They also have this product called Fortisip, which they give to cancer patients who, um, human cancer patients who don't have an appetite anymore. So when they're going yeah. through, through treatment to put on weight, they give them these build-up drinks that just have a huge amount of sugars and soy proteins and oh. hydrogenated oils. And, just uh, everything that that you and I believe. Uh, I, I think you and I would both agree that uh, there's a lot of evidence suggesting that these things are linked to metabolic disturbances, um, mitochondrial dysfunction, toxicity. I mean, wh whatever angle you want to take, there are a lot of problems with these foods, and it's just it's appalling to see them applied in a in like a medical setting, whereas. And of course, you know, meat meat's demonized, right? It's like, oh, hooray, rejoice. We've got Beyond Burgers in hospitals now under the fluorescent lights with the, uh, you know, the, in, in this uh, highly toxic environment, we, we've got Beyond Burgers. And this is so good because it's not meat. And um, yeah, it's, it's just crazy because I've seen so many people who've recovered their health, recovered from serious autoimmune conditions from removing all plant foods. And I don't necessarily believe all plants are bad, right? Like I don't, I'm not gonna say all plants are bad, uh, but there are some people who benefit from the removal of all plants from their diet. You were the first one I met that kind of opened me up to this idea. Um, do, you, uh, do you mind if I ask you about like your diet now, what you're doing and uh, what you've been doing for the last year or so? I'm mostly eating game at the moment because that's mainly what I can get hold of. I have a really good source. Um, so I'm eating mostly rabbits at the moment, whole rabbits. And Not, uh, not enough fat in that though, right? Are you adding some fat? Well, is, are they fatty rabbits? <laughs> they're, they're, they're not really that fatty, but I kind of did this on purpose because I, when I was incorporating the plant foods back in my diet, I started to gain quite a bit of body fat and it got to the point where I just wasn't really very happy with that. So, <laughs> so I decided to cut out all the plant foods again. And then, so was that like avocado and keto friendly plants or were you eating some like fruit and stuff too? No, it was just, well, avocado is a fruit, isn't it? So, <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously. Um, but I mean, I mean like yeah. it was, it wasn't like non keto foods. It wasn't glucose, um, I was I was having some of these keto breads and cakes that you can make and yeah. um I was having seizures threshold change at all during that period? No, because my tolerance is quite high at the moment. Oh, that's um, so cool. So so, so that's you could what, handle it, why... no no big deal with the seizures. It was just physically maybe you didn't feel as healthy and uh, your your body fat levels kind of indicated that there was some metabolic uh inferiority to the to that situation. Yeah, even even though on my um, I was still taking readings on my glucometer, and even though everything still looked fantastic, I just was starting to get fat, and my sleep wasn't as good, and I started mm -hmm. to get bags under my eyes, which mm -hmm. I don't have anymore, and I also had um, some grey hairs, which are gone mm -hmm. now. Um, oh, that's cool. So, so yeah. Um, I started to go back to just cutting. All I, I noticed some gray hairs. I get some gray hairs too, but I think, I don't think I'm going to, I don't think I'm going to reverse those ones. I think those are, <laughs> I think my gray hairs are here to stay. Um, well, I, I thought it was just aging because just, yeah. uh, my brothers and my, uh, my brothers, uh, were going gray at around my age. Cause same here. My dad was pretty bald by the time he was like 32 or three, he was taking Propecia and stuff. I mean, I shaved my head, but I'm not like completely bald. I still got some, I still got to the fuzz. I just, uh, yeah, but I, I do notice I get some more gray hairs. My dad's fully gray now. So I know it's eventually it's going to happen, but there's got to be some sort of a, you know, an oxidative stress 
uh, accelerator because people go through stressful times and you're like, man, like you're all right. You kind of look kind of, you look like shit, you know, like you're, you're really gray and you're, you're getting wrinkles, you get bags under your eyes. You see that accelerated aging with stress or with uh, plant-based diets, right. Or with um, not sleeping and being a student, <laughs> you know, these, mm-hmm. these kind of things seem to have an effect, but dude, that's and crazy. I've, just I've, from the plant foods. Yeah. I've never had any gut problems either. So um, often you get vegans saying, when you go on a carnivorous diet, oh, it's because they have some gut, uh, SIBO, SIBO or some gut mm-hmm. issues. But I, I had all those tests and I didn't have any problems there. It was just neurological issues that yeah. I was having. And when I cut those foods out, I just feel so much better. So it makes sense. To, it made sense to go yeah. back on that diet. You, you're like our canary in the coal mine. You know, I mean, it's 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 interesting to see how well, there's different people who react to different environmental stressors um, and are sensitive to different environmental stressors. That's always something that's interesting to me too, you know, like people who are EMF sensitive, right? Like there are people, but when they're around Wi-Fi, they're, they're like, they'll feel it. They're like, oh man, I know I'm going to turn on my phone. I'm going to see that there's 4G signal because I get a headache. Like I've met some of these people before. And yeah, like there are some people who are just like mentally ill and they're, they're always like misdiagnosing themselves and stuff. There's people that do that, but then there are some people who are legitimately really sensitive to what's called like EMF, dirty electricity, stuff like that. There are people who are like non-celiac gluten sensitive and they know that when they eat bread or when they eat gluten, they're going to have, you know, bad reaction. They're going to get headaches. They might get, you know, whatever inflammatory condition tends to recur in them. They'll get that. Um, and then there's other people who can handle gluten and uh, they do great with it. But if they eat, you know, high, uh, you know, like really high fat diet, they can't digest fat. Right. So it's just, there's, there's so many different expressions that, uh, that these things that interest me, but it does seem like there is something about plant foods for a part of the population that, um, that is just detrimental and, avocado you wouldn't think that like some avocado or some like what like psyllium husk breads and stuff or what, what, what else were you having like uh, chia seed breads and stuff like that yeah and uh almond flour and stuff like that i know almond okay. flour is not good especially if you're heating it yeah. <laughs> not, the, not the best idea but uh, yeah. i got to a stage where i was just feeling overconfident thinking oh just a little bit here and there's not going to affect me and I then I and then I added sweet and the the stevia and that just completely messed me up. That's a weird and, one. And stevia. this and the, this was the proper stuff. So it was the the actual green kind of powder. So it's the actual the leaf. leaf. And I I made sure it was you know the best quality, but yes. I, I was just it was affecting me. It was making me. What do you think it is? Do you think, my, do you think oxalates? Because when I'm hearing I'm hearing like almond flour, we know that that's a pretty high oxalate food. And I think stevia, 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 stavia, I don't know how we say it, uh, but that's supposedly also like an oxalate uh, loaded food. Well, I think also it's because it's just intensely sweet and I don't do well with any kind of sweet sensation. I feel like if I'm desiring sweetness, then I'm not, I'm not properly adapted to, I'm either not properly adapted to my diet or there's just something else going on. And I don't think we know the long-term effects of stevia yet. I don't think it's been studied long-term. When I first met you, could, were you able to grow a beard? I feel like the beard's like, like your testosterone went up or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, just um, my girlfriend likes it. So okay, she told me not to shave because she said I look like um, a 13-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> Cause like, it's funny. Cause I, I look at the beard. I'm like, I don't remember you ever having a beard. I wonder if you like, you know, if, if this is a new, some people, they couldn't grow a beard. Their hormones were messed up. They changed their diet and you know, suddenly, you know, they're, they're growing facial hair and hopefully not as a woman. Uh, and it, suddenly like, you know, they, they feel better hormonally. So I was, uh, yeah, I, I was wondering if that was you know part of it, but yeah, just girlfriend influence. In terms of just, we mentioned seed oils before. Mm. what do you think are the main the main problems with that and when people say oh well it's just the way it's 
it's just the way it's produced and if you have cold cold pressed oils that's okay that's a good question man yeah so this is something i've been exploring for a while right like when you first get into health nutrition or when i first got into health and nutrition this was one of the first things i learned about was all the seed oils all the the contamination with pesticides and stuff the processing agents like there's a lot of hexane that gets used in the extraction of some of these things which is highly toxic um i think that's definitely an issue the processing of these seed oils most definitely is an issue you're going to get contamination from hexane you're going to have residues in these things i've seen how a lot of these things are produced i've worked in the import export industry of food um and i understand that there is there are major issues with production of food and with processing of food and contamination of food during processing and during the growing cycle but I also think that the omega-6 inflammatory fatty acids that are in those seed oils are a major issue too. So we're probably dealing with uh, decreased mitochondrial function from exposure to these seed oils from the omega-6s, right? We're also probably dealing with uh, you know, an inflammatory reaction and an insulin resistance being developed quickly when we get exposed to those omega-6s. And then if you compound that with these other solvents that are used in the extraction of them and the chemical contamination that we have in there, we're probably seeing increased oxidative stress, increased damage to the cells and further exacerbation of any issues that are going to manifest. So it's almost like it's a double whammy that's kind of compounding. I don't think we should be consuming these foods, even if they're optimally cold pressed. I still don't think like, you know, cotton oil or uh, canola oil corn oil soy oil i don't think these should be eaten olive oil i'm cool with olive oil you know i mean i don't know how how you do with olive oil when you eat it but i think um i don't think it's an issue for most people mm. i'm okay with olive oil but i make sure it's extra virgin olive oil and that it has the ph on it because normally it doesn't even say the ph but i get mm. it from a, a supplier that just really emphasizes the importance of the, the pH of the oil, which I don't think even many people I didn't even discuss. Know about that. Yeah, I didn't yeah, either no, before. Didn't we get this olive oil here. There's an olive oil from Peru that's really, really good. Um, it's bot botija olives, and it's like, it's very bitter. It's got this really, really deep flavor, and it's, um, it's really amazing. So I, I do like olive oil. But I, I don't know. I got like 10 bottles of that stuff up in the rafters. I never eat it. I still eat all animal fats. But I do like olive oil. If I was, if there was a famine, I would eat that olive oil. Unless it goes rancid. I don't know how long it lasts. I should probably check on that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I like olive oil. But most of these seed oils, I think, should be avoided. Um, same with things like almond flour. Like, look, some of these breads, these keto breads and stuff, they're tasty. But I still think you know, almond flour... Being exposed to that many of the omega-6 fatty acids and the oxalate level in that, I think it can be an issue. I think for some people, oxalates can be a major issue. I've experimented with low and no oxalate diets. I've experimented with um, a lot of these different modalities, carnivore approach. I think these are all very, very important tools that people can use. And um, But I think for the average person, like maybe somebody not like you or I who's going to uh, go a little bit deeper into this stuff and experiment more because of uh, you know, either health issues or curiosity, but I think the average person who just wants to be healthy, if they were to focus on animal fat and animal protein as a basic foundation of a diet, quality animal fats, not you know mass-produced uh, factory farmed pigs and chickens, I'm talking like ruminant grass-fed uh, quality animals that are, you know, eating pasture most of their life. I don't mean, I don't think it's bad to feed grain to an animal, but if it's really low quality feed and it's contaminated with pesticides, we also could be getting some issues, right? But um, I think a focus on animal foods and incorporating, shoot, if you want to have carbohydrates, incorporating seasonal fruits and uh, seasonal fruits for most people, great idea. I'm not so sold on vegetables being this panacea for health. I actually think for the average person, you know, for my kids, for instance, uh, or, or myself, if I'm going to consume carbohydrates, it's going to be from something like fruit, local raw honey, uh, or raw milk. And uh, so, yeah, I, I don't think that carbohydrate restriction is great for everybody, 
But I think the type of carbohydrates that you eat is going to be important, right? So lots of grains, not a big fan of that. I don't think the, uh, the heavy grain diets are going to do anybody any good. I think a focus on minimally processed, unrefined animal foods. And um, if you're going to have carbohydrates, things like fruit, local honey, raw milk, I think this is uh, going to be the best approach for most people. And fully carnivore, I think, is great. Obviously, most people aren't going to go there. Most people are you know, afraid to even try a ketogenic diet. Um, but you can live exclusively off of animal foods. And a lot of people find that it really improves their health, their digestion. I mean, I find now, like I'm able, after two years of carnivore, I'm able to handle more carbohydrates. I'm able to handle more foods that before I would have thought would send me to the toilet. I'm able to handle these really effectively. I still don't find myself wanting, you know, it's like if I eat grains, if I have some bread or something, I'm still not going to, my digestion is going to be not as optimal for a couple days. Like it might, I might get a slight drop in cognition and stuff like that. But I find that my gut functions a lot better now, just from that basic state of a carnivorous ketogenic approach, giving myself all the fats, giving myself the protein, and, um, and yeah, I think, I think it can do a lot of good for people's gut to remove these seed oils, remove the grains, remove, maybe even look at removing high oxalate foods for a while, right? So if you're eating a lot of spinach, you're eating a lot of almonds, these might be having an effect. Whether it's the oxalates or something else, I'm not exactly sure, right? But we do know um, the result that people are getting from removing some of these foods. And focusing on whole unrefined animal foods is, uh, it's pretty stunning and pretty amazing what do you what do you think about that like as far as like glucose goes right uh what do you think are better sources of carbohydrate for those people who do want to consume carbs whether it be you know just the average person who's not uh sold that keto is a good idea or necessary for them or somebody who's doing like athletics uh and wants to use carbohydrates for performance what do you think are safer carbs i just think anything that's local and seasonal and maybe even just above the ground rather than under the ground so not so like uh, rather than tubers fruits probably easier yeah anything that's local and seasonal that's what i always say just you can argue with me all you want about diet but i think i i can't really argue if you're eating anything that's local to you and is seasonal and as in is organic just it grows naturally yeah like even if you go to the supermarket and get berries it would be better for you to pick some wild berries even if it's the same kind of fruit Mm. yeah just yeah for sure man i think absolutely true you know, and then the longer the longer these foods are being transported the longer that they're uh you know off the vine right you're losing nutritional quality as well so i think the uh the whole mass production and you know the the whole like globalization of our food supply although it's cool that everyone can have chocolate right everyone can have bananas like it's all it's so convenient like we get all these foods we can all have um you know berries at any time of the year it's fun and it's novel it's convenient but the nutritional quality of imported exported foods that are mass produced or lower. The soil quality gets depleted. Locally produced foods um, require less transportation, which is causing less uh, pollution from uh, petrochemicals, right? Less uh, need for mining, less need for massive machines to uh, less need for tilling, which actually does remove carbon from the ground. Not that I think that like, you know, carbon dioxide is uh, this terrible toxin or anything like that. I don't uh, buy into the uh, greenhouse gas theory for being a major driver of uh, climate change. I think the sun uh, is more likely a culprit of um, the seasonal variation and changes in our climate. But um, yeah, the local production of food, I think, is something that people really should focus on for the health of themselves and their bodies. And also the health of their communities, right? Like we should, we should really be supporting, especially right now, um, we should really be focusing on supporting local food producers, small family farms. I mean, these are being squeezed out of existence all over the United States, all over Europe, all over the world, over South America as well. You see the consolidation of uh, the food supply happening. And 
it creates a very fragile food system where if there's a simple disruption in the food supply, like we're seeing with all the consolidated meat production now, you see 25% possible reduction in uh, swine herds worldwide due to this uh, swine flu or whatever crisis. I'm not really sure exactly what's going on with the swine flu thing, but it, it, it something does seem a little bit fishy here. Um, and we're seeing food shortages being created by this very, very fragile vertically integrated system of food production and buying local food, getting involved in food production and supporting local producers, especially local animal food, uh, animal husbandry uh, users, and animal um, husbandry promoters who are you know, regenerating soil, who are creating local protein and fat sources that don't require heavy machinery, a bunch of mined minerals and metal machines and uh, you know, industrial processing equipment to make protein and fat. We should be promoting and supporting these people and this method of food production because it's healthier for us, but it's also really, really healthier, uh, a lot healthier for communities and for, um, you know, for cultures in general. Yeah. And you talk about, you talk a lot about the bioavailability of nutrients as well, just on an animal based diet versus a plant based diet. Um, yeah. I think that's often ignored. It's not really spoken about much by people who are promoting these plant-based diets um, well it's completely ignored isn't it because it has to be ignored right if you just look at it on paper oh look spinach has uh if you eat 10 pounds of spinach you're getting all the protein you need for the day right you have neil barnard saying if you just eat 2,000 calories worth of broccoli you're gonna get all the protein you need 2,000 calories of broccoli i think that's like less than 20 grams of protein. So he's completely wrong on that. But also if you look at the amino acid ratio of these plant foods, you're not providing protein in a bioavailable form in the right amino acid ratio. In fact, you have no idea what, um, uh, what these amino acids bioavailability is. The bioavailability meaning how available is it to be used by your body, right? If you have calcium in a spinach or in almonds, there's a significant amount of calcium. There's also some potassium, magnesium. But there's also something called oxalic acid. Now that oxalic acid is gonna to bind to calcium and create calcium oxalate crystals. You can't digest and assimilate those. They're gonna get excreted, hopefully. There's some evidence that they also get, uh, they also collect in the body, in scar tissue, in organs, in the thyroid. They can disrupt. Uh, hormone function that can disrupt your, uh, your, your endocrine function. So that's one example of a plant toxin that's going to bind to minerals. It's going to create a situation where you're not digesting and getting the minerals and nutrients that on paper, the plant-based gurus are going to say, look, look at all this calcium. Look at all the spinach. Check it out. It's got protein in it, right? Well, very, very different protein in broccoli than there is in meat, right? When you're looking at meat, you're looking at a perfect amino acid ratio, easily digested, no fiber, no anti-nutrients, no indigestible material. It's just pure protein, fat, collagen, um, bioavailable food, bioavailable amino acids in the right ratio for us. Whereas plant foods, uh, they have to be very carefully mis uh, mixed and matched to get on paper the same amino acid ratio that makes it digestible to us uh, that meat contains, right? So these people in the plant-based movement, they'll say, look, the originator of protein is the plant, right? Like the cow eats the grass and the grass has the protein in it. So we're going to cut out the middleman and we're going to eat the plants directly. And this sounds really cool if you don't understand anything about human biology, the digestive system, uh, shoot food production and processing. It sounds really cool, but it's pure marketing. It's pure PR. It's propaganda, right? Um, animals take indigestible plant material. They process that for us on site. They're byproducts of this processing of indigestible plant material into digestible fat, protein, collagen, into very, very highly bioavailable, nutrient-dense animal food. The processing of this has the byproducts of fertilizer, which can be used to grow plants, that can be eaten by us or fed to animals that will then convert it into bioavailable protein and fat for us. If they create fertilizer, which regenerates the soil, um, they, they also are 
reworking landscapes if used properly in regenerative grazing techniques like the Savory Institute teaches. Uh, these animals will actually re uh, constitute the soil. They'll actually amend the soil and help to bring back biodiversity and wildlife to areas that didn't have this biodiversity before. They've done this in Zimbabwe and uh, with regenerative agriculture and regenerative grazing, we're seeing a lot of good results all over the place. And, um, and this gets bypassed, right? This gets overlooked and we're being sold, you know, just mass produced, uh, you know, chemical factory slop kibble. Instead, you know, you have to grow the wheat or the corn or the soy over in Brazil, right? So these mining companies, they go over there to take the minerals, to extract gold and silver, to extract uh, lithium from these areas. And, uh, you know, so they clear cut rainforest, they sell off all the timber. And then what's left is empty lots where the soil is terrible people think that some for some reason like oh the the amazon must have an amazing soil therefore they're just converting it into farmland no what's happening is these mining companies go in there so that we can have our iphones so that we can uh, have our uh, you know industrial uh you know, the consumer electronic products these mining companies go in there they extract the minerals they extract the oil right they extract the gasoline uh from the land and then What's left is a big lot that gets used to grow basically Monsanto corn or soy is what happens in most of Brazil. Then that corn or soy gets exported to China. They process that into soy oil in China or uh, whatever uh, other protein-based foods you have. And then the soy cake that they press the oil out of and that they use chemical solvents to extract the oil from, that then gets fed to pigs that then gets fed to chicken that then gets fed to cows over there in china that they're feeding to much of the world right so we have this kind of huge industrial system all based on the uh, the heavy production of soy uh using industrial machinery and uh and it, it's creating all sorts of byproducts we're using all sorts of uh resources to actually ship this stuff all over the world and process it when we could be producing all these foods locally we can be producing all these foods in our own environments, regenerating our soil. Um, so it, it, it's a big trade-off, right? Culturally, we are affected by this at a grand scale. So I think, the, uh, I think it's very important that we focus on animal-based nutrition, not just for our health, um, you know, the health of our bodies, but also for the you know, future generations. When we're being slowly and surely cut off from knowledge about how to feed ourselves, from knowledge about how to create how to uh, make food how to produce food and this is um, very detrimental to us but very beneficial to uh, big industry you know, unfortunately so i think the uh the issues around food it, it goes beyond just nutrition obviously it's huge uh, the huge factor there is nutrition and um but also you know the the food production methods that we're using are very suboptimal and very destructive on many levels and so yeah i think that we started from amino acids and bioavailability we got to that but it's um yeah it's it, it's a slippery slope there you start justifying uh on paper these plant-based diets may look good right if you write down all the minerals that you're going to be getting that are uh, supposedly in these foods that are in chickpeas and lentils and um and beans and rice yes they have amino acids yes they have minerals Right? But rocks also have minerals, right? Like I can go outside and I can grind up that concrete right out there and I'm going to be getting lots of calcium. There's loads of calcium in there. There's loads of magnesium in those rocks. But is this bioavailable and digestible? Um, that's what we need to be looking at. The bioavailability of foods is definitely um, something that is often overlooked and that the carnivore movement has done a really good job of pointing out the importance of. So uh, I really appreciate Amber O'Hearn has done some really good work on this and Let's see, Georgia Eat, Dr. Georgia Eat has also put out some really good articles on the importance of animal foods and um, bioavailability is going to be something that hopefully gets more attention in the coming years. I think uh, next year we're probably going to see a little bit more, a little bit more dialogue about the bioavailability of food in response to the heavy handed push uh, that we're going to get from you know, processed plant food based diets. Uh, this is going to continue, right? There's a lot of money being pushed into promoting beyond ink, into promoting uh, <clears throat> impossible foods, and now into promoting lab-grown meat. So in the next couple of years, we're going to see a big transition of big money being pushed into developing cell-cultured meat, they're going to call it, 
uh, they're coming up with all these Orwellian terms, uh, smart meat, clean meat, they're going to call it, but it's basically lab grown meat. That's going to take 10 times as many resources to produce as real meat. Uh, and it's going to increase the price of food dramatically. But, um, yeah, so uh, in order to fight against this, I think local food production, focusing on things like bioavailability of nutrients, nutrient density, uh, and of course, also the production line, right? Like how much energy, how many resources are spent producing one gram of bioavailable digestible protein from animals as opposed to not very bioavailable, hardly digestible, and tastes like utter crap protein from something like a Beyond Burger. Right, we really have to consider this and uh, consider more than just you know, what on paper looks like protein, fat, carbohydrates, vitamins, minerals, amino acids. It's not so simple as that. Yeah, I think you covered a lot of things there. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. What would you say to people who are proponents of plant-based diets and these so-called longevity experts where they're saying, what about mTOR? What about TMAO? What about um having so much protein in the diet and um yeah yeah, yeah this is that's a really good question things. that's a hard one I'm, we're constantly uh we're constantly being bombarded from different angles of these uh of these arguments the mTOR thing we're looking at rat studies again aren't we isn't it the mTOR they're looking at rat studies increasing mTOR and perhaps shortening lifespan and also I'm perhaps also sure. it's not always a bad thing Sometimes we need to elevate mTOR. It's not always bad. It's yeah. dependent on the situation, maybe. Absolutely true. So, but then also, you know, to play uh, to play uh, carbohydrate devil's advocate. What about insulin? Right? You could maybe make the same argument for insulin. Right? So, low carb advocates saying, look, keeping insulin low is crucial for health outcomes. Is crucial for maintaining stable blood glucose levels. For maintaining low inflammation. Whereas uh, you know others would say, well, look, I mean, it's insulin has its place, and maybe it's a good idea to be spiking insulin every once in a while. Yeah, it's it's as bad being too low as too high sometimes. Um, yeah, you mentioned amino acids. Some plant-based proponents would say that it's good to be on these de deficient plant-based diets because. Um, and, tour, right? and also there's this big thing about methionine restriction for uh, managing cancer. You go on these methionine restricted diets, but then you mentioned the ratio in these uh, animals, in these, in these animal foods, and the ratio of methionine to glycine is important. So having that, the right amount of glycine actually offsets if you were to just just give methionine on its own in these rodent studies that's what's driving these um what do you cancers, think about that i don't really know what in to isolation make right yeah so we're looking at isolated amino acids but it's not I mean, how do you control the methionine to glycine ratio different cuts of meat have different amounts of collagen which is where the glycine is um yeah i, I i'm not really sure what to make of some of these arguments sometimes i think a lot of these things that we're looking at theory we're looking at okay well theoretically because in a rat model the methionine to glycine ratio seems to matter in this type of rat we've got a lot of assumptions built in there that haven't really been fleshed out experimentally in humans um but i mean it, could they have a valid point i uh, of course right i mean this is something that could be studied but I don't know how you would actually study this in humans. What we do know is that people have been eating animal foods primarily and people do self-select to eat animal foods primarily uh, when they don't have access to uh, the Western imported foods. So if you read like uh, Weston A. Price's book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, I think it's a really important book uh, for nutrition, but also for anthropology and history. He was traveling around and visiting cultures in the 1930s and 40s. And it was the 1930s actually, he published his book in like 1940. And he was meeting all these uh, different people in different, uh, in different cultures, these indigenous tribes and places uh, in Africa. He was visiting uh, the islanders in the Pacific Island. He visited the Andean Highlands. He visited people uh, everywhere, all over the world, the Lushenta Valley in Switzerland, he, uh, the Hebrides Islands. Every single one of these cultures was, pro uh, was focusing their nutritional 
uh, was focusing their nutrition on primarily animal foods, right? Every single one of these, the Hebrides Islands were eating mostly fish and they had some sheep, I believe, on that island as well. And then they would produce some oats, small amounts of oats that they had to grow in a very specific way using the peat moss from their roofs, the thatch roofs that they'd use for fertilizer to grow these oats. And they were eating mostly crab, fish, the island, uh, in the Pacific Islands, uh, you had like a lot of these Polynesian people were eating primarily fish, crab, seafood, but also eating seasonally available fruits that were on the island, but still they weren't like fruitarians or anything like that. They looked at these foods as extra and they really sought after animal foods, fish and shellfish and seafood. Uh, you look at the little Shentel Valley, these people were living exclusively off of uh, dairy, primarily dairy and then also having broth having meat a few times a week but eating a lot of cheese and then they would have some rye bread that they grew locally right but the majority of calories from all these people across the board were coming from animal foods and they were also eating some tubers and stuff and some of these uh and some of these cultures but animal foods were crucial for all of them none of them had high cancer rates none, uh, in all of these places um there were actually, there was very low crime rates as well in a lot of these societies and these cultures. Um, but they weren't, they weren't seeing nutritional deficiencies like they were seeing in England and in America at the time where you had dental caries, where you had women, women getting a uh, narrowing of the hips, which would make it difficult to have children. Uh, they, Weston Price uh, noticed that most of these women gave birth very easily with minimal difficulty. Um, you know, they squatted out, the baby came out, and they got on with their day, kind of a thing. It was, you know, it was, it was remarkable what health, what good health these people were in. No tuberculosis, no cancer, none of the modern diseases that we see now. No dental caries. He was a dentist who started the American Dental Association, and um, yeah, they were all eating primarily animal foods. As soon as imported foods, uh, heavy grain-based diets, heavy uh, imported food diets came in and replaced their locally produced animal fats and protein that they were sourcing. And, uh, and cultivating, they would see dental caries, they would see um, uh, immune function lowering, they'd see tuberculosis, they'd see cancers, they'd see all sorts of issues with health. And um, yeah, so I think uh, looking at some of these, uh, some of the eating habits of pre-industrial cultures is very important. And um, I, I, I'm not convinced that meat is bad i think a lot of these theories they're they're really stretching it with some of these things you know the methionine the glycine ratio uh the mTOR arguments uh igf1 a lot of these arguments really don't they just kind of seem like they're grasping at straws sometimes so they're starting with the assumption that well meat must be bad because it's so obvious that meat is bad, right? It's just like, well, obviously meat is bad. And then they start looking for ways to justify it. And some of them are getting ridiculous. You know, the TMAO thing where it's like, well, TMAO is good if it comes from plants, but it's bad if it comes from animals. Like there's a lot of inconsistency in the argumentation and a lot of what sometimes seems like intellectual dishonesty. And I'm not saying that anybody out there who says that meat is bad is intellectually dishonest, but we have some, seen some arguments from guys like Joel Kahn when he uh, debated Cresser on Joe Rogan's show. There, was, there were some moments there where there were narratives he pushed that were very, very nonsensical. I mean, that Neil Barnard on uh, London Real recently, I did a stream and uh, we discussed some of the statements he made where he said, Meat eaters are worse off than alcoholics, right? I mean, this is some of the rhetoric that's coming out from these people. And they're kind of, they're showing their hands. They're showing how, um, how intellectually specious they're being in a lot of these arguments. And, uh, and I, I appreciate that it's being revealed, but also it's very alarming because then it brings up the question of, well, you know, how many of these, uh, you know, what else, what other arguments that are being pushed out there are just, kind of distraction red herring arguments um this is yeah, fiber really one nation. as well saying we need fiber 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 is a weird one i mean i i think that fiber it's certain types of fiber i can digest right like i can uh, bananas right like the bananas are pretty easy to digest uh plantains that's a starchy it's like a more starchy banana plantains i can digest those but like fiber from kale or <laughs> Uh, whole grains. I mean, the, some of these fibers, they're so, these are so abrasive and so 
harsh to digest. You know, the, uh, the insoluble fiber, I don't know, just some of these things, they, they just seem really, really negative yeah. for health for a lot of people. So yeah, the fiber thing is similar. It's, you, people say you need fiber for constipation. Yet there are, there's a really good experiment out there about uh, low and no fiber diets for, I think it's called zero fiber diets for idiopathic constipation. And they took like 69 people who had chronic constipation and they weeded them out. And they made sure that none of the experiment, uh, none of the people in the experiment had blockages in their colon or had like a physiological reason. And they found that when they pulled out fiber from the diet, the ones that had no fiber in the diet had on average one bowel movement per day. So their bowel frequency increased and improved. They had very, very minimal difficulty passing stools and everything was good. The people on a low fiber diet, I think it was something like 30 or 60%. I forget which one, but a portion of those people um, improved a little bit on the low fiber diet. Most of them say uh, about the same. And the people on the high fiber diet, all of them continued to have one bowel movement on average every four days. Nothing improved for any of these people. So I think removing fiber might be one of the most powerful interventions that people can have if they're dealing with chronic constipation, if they're dealing with things like um, uh, ulcerative colitis, uh, irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, I've seen a lot of people benefit from removing fiber and removing plants from the diet and focusing on animal foods. So what's, so, what's most important to me is what really works, right? What's most important to me is what actually helps people and what actually works in the real world. What's not important to me is pie in the sky theories about what on paper can be um, manipulated in order to make you either afraid of or obsessed with certain foods, right? The whole sulforaphane uh, thing doesn't seem to play out in the real world, although I'm open to it, all right? If it helps people, that's great, but I don't, I don't really see um, a, a lot of real world application for that. And um, yeah, so I think, I think fiber is, is, it's a major deception out there. More fiber, not necessarily better for a lot of people especially myself, right? There's certain fibers that I can deal with. I can digest some fruit, but uh, just saying like, oh, across the board, fiber, increasing fiber is good for everybody is I think a big mistake and will be looked back upon. Hopefully very soon will be looked back on as uh, as something that was, uh, that was really stupid. Yeah. People will then say, well, what about the gut microbiome? Yeah, how are you going to poop? What about the gut microbiome? Well, just in terms of diversity. Um, right, right. So are we so sure? All right, first of all, more gut microbiome diversity equals better health outcomes. That's a pretty big logical leap. Although, let's make the assumption, right? Let's make the assumption. Uh, what I have seen in several cases, and there's one guy, what is his name on Twitter? Let me, uh, let me find this guy's name on Twitter so I don't mess up his name. Um, Adam Viskovich. Uh, do you follow him on Twitter? He's an interesting guy. Uh, yeah, I interesting. think he uh, communicated that he was on a carnivorous diet and his, uh, his diversity of his gut microbiota was actually quite high. It was higher than when he was eating plants, which was very interesting. 13 years of ulcerative colitis, right? So he's got supposedly a five times greater risk of getting colon cancer than the general population. He's been eating an all meat diet for a while now. I think it's like over two years. And let's see. So here's his tweet from what's the date on this one? February 2019. So when I was vegan, my gut diversity was in the third percentile. At third percentile gut diversity, according to where did he get this measure? Was it? I think it was U Biome. Uh, yeah, U Biome. After carnivore for a week, it jumped up to the 81st percentile in diversity, right? So let's go by the assumption that more diversity equals better, which I don't necessarily believe at this point. I think this has to be, uh, this is, it's a big leap, right? I mean, just because you have more diversity doesn't mean it's necessarily better. You could have high diversity of uh, highly inflammatory strains of bacteria that are not very good for you. So, but after a week, it jumped up to 81st percentile. And then after a year of eating no fiber, it was in the 92nd percentile. 
And so, do, do you think there's also some influence of beta hydroxybutyrate because that has an effect on the gut microbiome, doesn't it? So, it's like absolutely. butyrate by beta hydroxybutyrate. I think you spoke about that once. Um, do you have any yeah. insights on well, that? Yeah, it's a good question, man. So, they're talking about when, when you look at some of these bacteria in the gut, butyrate. Uh, how are you going to make butyrate? Butyrate is the fermentation of indigestible fiber released butyrate. But beta hydroxybutyrate is the ketone that's in present, uh, that's elevated when you're on a ketogenic diet. When you reduce your carbohydrate intake and you're having a high fat intake and you're burning fat, you're going to have butyrate all throughout your blood. So we could be seeing um, high production of butyrate just via ketogenesis in the body, which would greatly affect the gut microbiome, which would really affect uh, the entire landscape there. But I, I tend to think that a more, rather than looking at like the germ theory for disease, I think looking at the terrain theory is a lot more interesting, right? Like we could have certain gut bacteria that would serve different functions depending on the context, right? So something that in one state, in one physiological state could be beneficial, could then become pathogenic given different circumstances environmentally, right? So we're going to see different expression of different bacteria. We could even see, uh, you know, transmutation of different bacteria, the production of different bacteria under different uh, metabolic conditions and under different environmental conditions. So this is, it's something that's not so simple as like more gut bacteria equals better, but people who are on a carnivore diet and are seeing improvements in health are also seeing improvements in, <clears throat> in, their, uh, in their gut microbiome diversity, which is pretty cool. I think there's also the antioxidant myth that plant-based proponents like to push, just the fact that they yeah. say and that you need to eat all these antioxidants, but if you're on a more ketogenic diet, you're producing endogenous antioxidants which are potentially just uh, a lot better <laughs> and and eating all these antioxidants from the the diet can actually be problematic yes yes and i think i think this is something to explore man i think uh you know the the rampant use of antioxidant supplements might be not beneficial to people we might be exacerbating issues and when you eat some of these so-called antioxidant-rich foods, the antioxidants in these foods, in a, in a lot of these foods, what we're seeing, correct me if I'm wrong, aren't we seeing the body producing natural antioxidants in response to what some people would claim is a hormetic response, right? So they'll say, oh, well, you know, uh, when you eat sulforaphane, it's creating this great hormetic response that then elicits your body through the NRF2 pathway to increase the output of endogenous antioxidants. Is that, a, is that a good way of explaining it? Yeah, I think that sounds... And when, so, when you're in ketosis, you have the same pathway that's... Um, yeah. ...affected. So. Right, right. So why... Yeah, well, why, um, why not just allow your body to create those antioxidants as it needs to? And are these compounds creating our endogenous antioxidant defense because they're creating stress, right? Like, is this a net benefit or is it just being used to deal with the stress of these plant compounds and these toxins that then evoke this response by our immune system? This is something that has not been answered fully. Uh, and I think we need to explore that a little bit more as well. So antioxidants being necessary in the diet, I don't think it's necessarily true at all. Um, but it's funny because cholesterol is also an antioxidant, <laughs> right? I mean, uh, you've got... Uh, glutathione increasing dramatically on a ketogenic diet, right? You've got uh, fatty acid uh, utilization and transport being upregulated greatly, right? Uh, cholesterol, very, very important for the immune system, very powerful antioxidant as well. So I think there's, there's a lot more going on here. Fat is being demonized when fat is one of the most important things that we can consume, right? Our body uh, contains fat, ubiquitously throughout it our body contains cholesterol uh everywhere it's ubiquitous in our body and uh to, to say that fat is bad that animal foods are inherently bad is 
this is just a major mistake in my opinion. I think that these are uh, this is going to be looked back on as kind of the uh, uh, the dark ages of nutrition science if we ever come out of it, right? If it if it ever stops uh, going in circles. Uh, this is, should be looked at as a uh, you know, very barbaric way of looking at nutrition and uh, a very inhumane way of, um, uh, of treating disease as far as, uh, as far as modern treatment goes. So yeah, fat, fat is bad, they're going to say, but it's actually one of the, it's the complete opposite. Fat is absolutely necessary. Um, fat is very protective, very important for detoxification. And I think, um, yeah, I think the uh, the antioxidants are necessary. We need to eat a lot of endogenous antioxidants. I think it's uh, not really played out in the real world. And I think we're looking at a lot of theory and grand narrative based on faulty assumptions. What do you think of the dairy argument, dairy and growth factors, say, with disease? It's not your milk, mate. It's not your milk. You're not a baby. Why are you drinking milk? Um yeah, I, we would def- I would definitely say that unpasteurized dairy is much better for you because you were able to digest it much better and it has all the beneficial bacteria. Yeah, man, I'm a big fan of raw dairy. I think raw milk's a great food. I think uh, fermentation of milk, I think uh, keeping, I think animals keeping, uh, you know, milking animals, ruminant animals is one of the most effective ways of feeding ourselves through local resources, the local environment. Uh, most people uh, tend to, especially in the British population, Dutch people, European people tend to digest milk, uh, especially raw dairy, very, very well. I think dairy is not necessarily bad. I think the, uh, this whole IGF-1 argument, IGF-1 is also very, very important for the immune system, right? So this, it's getting, these things are getting demonized. IGF-1 gets demonized. Uh, mTOR gets demonized. But these things are necessary for maintaining muscle. Um, and it's not necessarily bad. It's about the context. Now, um, yeah, I think, uh, like you said, pasteurization. Pasteurization creates major issues. We cannot digest pasteurized milk very well. These, uh, the live enzymes that are in milk, the living bacteria that's in milk can be very beneficial, and uh, it's completely destroyed when you pasteurize it. So I think dairy, raw dairy, locally produced raw dairy can be great. It's not for everybody. Some people do have sensitivities, but I think it's less people than we, uh, than most imagine. And uh, as far as like the growth factors, IGF one being uh, you know terrible and being so bad, when you look at uh, the civilizations that eat the most milk, that have the most dairy, that eat the most animal foods, these populations tend to live longer. When you look at Japan, right, these people talk about the blue zones, which is a complete myth. But when you do look at the longest lived populations in Japan, they all eat lots of animal foods, they all eat lots of eggs and cholesterol, and they all have high cholesterol levels. And so I think a lot of these things get demonized. Dairy gets demonized because of fat, because of cholesterol. And, um, yeah, I think uh, uh, people really need to look deeper into the history of pasteurization and the effects that it has on the bioavailability of the nutrients in that food. And um, and yeah, so dairy, not for everybody, but personally, I, I'm a fan. Like I digest raw milk pretty well. If I do too much of it, like it might be an issue, but I'm a big fan of like kefir, uh, fermentation of cheese, uh, yogurt. My kids love dairy. Uh, I'm personally a fan so yeah i think in some situations like cancers if you're trying to lose body fat maybe it's beneficial to cut it out right if you're trying to lose body fat and you're having trouble losing weight and you can't put down the block of cheese like that's an issue for some people and low quality dairy pasteurized dairy does seem to have some uh, to bring some issues about for many people uh, but it's about quality it's about how it's processed and um, it's not so simple as you know meat bad dairy bad and plants good right certain plants can be fine certain plants can be digested right like white rice way better food than uh than brown rice in my opinion right even though it's more processed a lot more easy for people to digest less indigestible fiber right less uh, abrasive indigestible material that you're eating there so um yeah it's not like uh i don't think we can really demonize all plant foods or all animal foods just like we can't demonize fat uh, or necessarily demonize glucose, right? Like our body 
makes glucose, right? Like a lot of people in the keto movement, oh, glucose is terrible. It's some toxic, terrible stuff. Look, it's so toxic. Well, no, your body needs it. Your body makes it, right? Uh, glucose is toxic. A lot of the, you know, the apologists for uh, petrochemicals and, and, and for agricultural chemicals will say, oh, well, glyphosate's not toxic. Water's toxic. If you eat enough, if you drink enough water, you'll die. You'll drown. <laughs> you know, it's like everything's toxic. Oxygen's toxic. But um, yeah, I think uh, if, we're, if we're really honest about it, um, we look at a lot of these foods, we have been, uh, we've been duped, right? Like we've been duped in, uh, into thinking that all animal foods are bad that all, they're, and all plant foods are good when it's not so simple, right? Yeah, there's some animal foods that are real low quality, right? Low quality, mass produced pork, very, very low quality fatty acid profile. If they're just fed a bunch of corn and soy, uh, they're going to have a lot of omega-6 and that might not be the most quality food. You're using loads of antibiotics and hormones and you're feeding them a bunch of uh, feed that's just uh, drenched in pesticides. They're going to accumulate a lot of those toxins. That could be a negative thing. That doesn't mean every single piece of meat is toxic. Right? Just like because you know, when you look at uh, soy production, right? uh, so destructive to the soil, very destructive to us, uh, feminizing uh, uh, chemicals, where if we're consuming soy regularly, men might see a, a estrogenizing effect. This is not a good thing. But that doesn't mean that like every single plant is bad. That doesn't mean that, you know, I got some bananas growing in the yard down here because we live in Ecuador. It doesn't mean that uh, if my kids are eating some bananas that they're going to die, right? It's, uh, there, there's a lot of this sectarian infighting and nutrition and a lot of it's BS, a lot of it's nonsense. And um, some of it is, uh, is really destructive. So I think the demonization of animal foods really needs to stop. Uh, we need to look a little bit deeper at uh, you know, the quality of food, the bioavailability of food. Of course, when we talk about dairy, bioavailability changes dramatically with pasteurization. And pasteurization, uh, it should be called bastardization, right? Pasteurization is really, really uh, detrimental to dairy and has basically destroyed one of the most beneficial foods that, uh, um, that we could be consuming, right? I mean, dairy, real good quality, raw dairy, locally produced raw dairy is fantastic. Mass produced, pasteurized dairy, um, neutral at best, probably pretty toxic in many regards. <clears throat> yeah, it's interesting in the cancer context because dairy can be both uh, either beneficial or detrimental in some ways it, ha it can gr grass-fed uh, unpasteurized dairy can have high amounts of cla and a beneficial fatty acid profile but cla on, that's a trans fat right <laughs> yeah the so-called bad bad fat so that's another thing also trans fats are so bad right well uh we're, we're looking at a specific compound in dairy right there that's very beneficial so i think yeah, this, this whole, uh, it's about taking it in context, right? You know, I mean, look, ketosis can be fantastic, but also like if you just starve yourself in ketosis and you fast yourself to death, sure, it's bad, right? You could say, oh, keto killed this person. I was like, no, that person just stopped eating completely and died because they were malnourished, right? That doesn't mean the ketones killed them. They weren't consuming the nutrients that they needed. Right, so there's a lot of frame games and linguistic games that get played here. Um, but that's fascinating, man. Yeah, right. I, I didn't even think about it. Dairy can be very beneficial depending on how it's framed and sold to you, right? It can be the death juice or it can be, you know, the miracle uh, liquid elixir of life, depending on who's marketing these ideas at you. I, and think I guess also, it's up to us. To yeah, I think also if you're uh, compelled to eat too much of it, so you have the argument of the A1 versus A2 uh, cheeses. Yeah. So uh, if you have these uh, cheeses that have the casomorphins that can cause you to want to eat more, and in the context of cancer, they, these compounds act like morphine, and morphine is no, known to make cancer much worse. It activates uh -huh. these receptors that just causes... The, any kind of malignancy to get worse and that's, that's like weird but, but do we know that those casomorphins are going to activate that receptor in the same exact way like, no is it's this... just theory again but it's interesting. right it's just like because it touches <laughs> this receptor it could though it that, could so 
it could, right? But it's like, yeah, it's it's a jump. It's it, we gotta. I wonder how if somebody's going to. Uh, it'd be interesting to flesh that out in experimentation. But I would right? say if it's compelling you to want to eat more of it, if you can't really feel like you can't really control yourself, that's probably a bad thing because some people just. Yeah. Even if they're full, they could easily eat a block of cheese, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's that's me. That guy's me. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, why, I've, that's, that's but, why I dude, avoid it, too. The thing, like, my kids also are, there's also the uh, the abundance and, and availability, right? It's like you only have so much. If you're, cre- if you're sourcing local food or involved in your producing your own food, you don't have the diseases of affluence, right? Like, you don't see overabundance of these foods so it's like same thing with sugary foods right with seasonal fruit like you can't stop eating it but also it's going to go bad if you stop eating it you're going to drop it on the ground the chickens are going to come eat it the worms are going to come get it the fruit flies are going to come get it the bears are going to come get whatever it is in your environment it's like that food is available right then it's highly bioavailable and it's nutritious and it serves a purpose but if you have watermelon every single day of your life available and you also have a gallon of milk available to you every single day and cheesecake <laughs> it's like you're gonna you're gonna run into some freaking issues right you're gonna have overnutrition. but if you haven't eaten for a whole week if you've been very low on food and then you have an abundance of one of these foods and you fill up you know you, and you're and you're craving these nutrients um Right? It's like hunger and satiety can be influenced by different things. And if we have a nutrient deficiency and we're really hungry for something, it can be hard to discern if we're just overeating or if we're trying to get these nutrients in, right? So it's like if you, you get what I'm saying? It's like somebody could be like kind of starving for some nutrient and they could be trying to get that fat in. They could be, you know, cholesterol deficient or fat deficient, which people think that sounds ridiculous because they're, you know, afraid of cholesterol and fat, but like you see it in vegans all the time like dude i can't stop eating cream (laughs) like i just keep eating it and in some cases it's like well you know you could get fat you could see some metabolic um aberrations there but then in other cases it could just be like yeah your skin and bones and your body wants to put on some weight and you're starving for vitamin d vitamin k2 so your body's just telling you to eat it and i think discernment and situational awareness with nutrition becomes important in such cases. So if you can't put down the block of cheese, you're 200 pounds, you've got metabolic uh, deficiencies, you've got, you know, you get brain fog after you eat and you're tending to overeat at meals, removing dairy is going to be like crucial for your progress, right? If you're 110 pounds and you've been on a seven year vegan diet and you did nothing but fruit for three months before you finally broke down and said, I got to eat meat again and I've got to eat animal foods. And you just want to just, you can't stop drinking milk. In that case, I might say, hey, you know what? Like, hey, if you were my son or daughter, I would just be giving you as much milk as possible until you get up to your 150 pounds and then we'll figure out where to be there. So um, yeah, it, this is a really good way. I think you framed it way more eloquently and I just babbled a bunch. But yeah, uh, it, it depends on the context. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Mm. Um, you also mentioned anti nutrients a lot. Anti nutrients in plants. Which plants would be the worst and which would be maybe the not so detrimental to consume? Good question. Well, I, we talked earlier about, you know, my, my kind of uh <clears throat> my food pyramid is gonna have animal foods at the base, right? Animal fat, protein, ruminant foods, fish, seafood, shellfish, dairy that's going to be the the base of the pyramid after that everything else is optional right the ones that are easiest to digest should be focused on right and that doesn't mean like the most processed they can go for the most unrefined unprocessed if you can the ones to be avoided i would say would be grains right so um high lectin high phytate foods like grains nuts and seeds i think these tend to be detrimental for a lot of people have a lot of uh, anti-nutrients. I think oxalate tends to be an issue for a lot of people. Um, After you remove oxalate, most people, I I, I say oxalate is a good first place to start, right? So it's going to be like spinach, nuts, seeds, um, almonds have a lot of oxalate. Uh, Removing oxalate can be a game changer for a lot of people. 
after you you know remove oxalate and grains you've what are you even left with i mean you've got like tubers and you've got fruit those are the seem to be the ones that people digest the easiest and when you look at healthy cultures pre-industrialization those are the foods they're focused on they're focused on sugary fruit and things like honey right honey is highly sought after bees have been cultivated for millennia um, so these simple sugars even though it seems counterintuitive uh, those seem easier to digest i'm not saying that everybody should be loading up on honey all the time like but seasonally available local foods like this can be good fruit and tubers um, tend to be easily digested although some of these tubers do have a lot of oxalate also but if you prepare them properly Proper preparation and boiling tends to remove a lot of this. And if you prepare foods properly, um, it does make them more bioavailable. So a lot of people do have issues with sweet potatoes. I think this could be due to oxalate. Um, I think a lot of people have issues with nuts, probably due to the phytic acid, but probably more due to oxalate as well. And then I think in the more extreme cases, like in yours, for instance, in the past, you had to completely avoid salicylates as well, which mm -hmm. most people don't ever have to consider that. No. Some people have to like know coconut that. oil. Right. Can you do coconut oil now? I can, yeah. But I still yeah. don't have too much just because I prefer the animal fats. They're a lot more nutrient dense. Tasty. Yeah, that yeah, too. Coconut oil is nice for skin. It's nice for massage. Mm. It's nice for sunburns. Um, which some people would say, that's crazy. A sunburn and you're putting coconut oil on it. will just <laughs> fry you. Yeah. Put saturated fat on it. No, it's a great sunblock. Yeah. You know what's crazy? In Weston Price's book, he talks about, I think it was in either Tahiti, in one of these island populations, they were using coconut oil for sunblock. They would lather it on their skins to protect them from the sun. And they already had very dark skin also, so they should have already been protected. But they knew that it was good for their skin and good for, um, I don't know if it's the fat, if it's the cholesterol. But that would make sense, right? You know, cholesterol being uh, important for the production of vitamin D. So, yeah. Um, why, do you, why, do you, why do you think in countries like Samoa, they're obese? They have these obese, they just naturally seem to be overweight. I don't know. What are they, I'm not sure culturally. I've never visited Samoa or studied it, but they are, uh, they're eating a lot of fish and uh, tubers. In, in, in uh because cause in Jack Cruz's kind of uh, idea, because they have okay. the, 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 the natural light, they, they would just never become overweight. So I've often wondered why they're so, so, <laughs> so overweight. I don't know. I don't really agree with, I think there are a lot of things that, that I would question about Jack's narrative, <laughs> uh, to say it nicely. Um, I just find that interesting. what I will say is, is there does seem to be a phenotype of people that look overweight, but are healthy and functioning. Yeah. So here in yeah. Ecuador, a lot of the indigenous, there are certain groups that are like wide and stocky, right? But also here, the diet is so westernized and there's so many seed oils and there's so much Coca-Cola and there's all the junk food, all the industrial shit is it's everywhere too. But the women here don't get fat like American women, like American white women, they get like, like folds, <laughs> like they get like that really, you know, like really, really big women and, uh, and men too. But like here, um, it, it, there's a different type of like fat. <laughs> it's like the, the, the ladies here, they've got like, they'll get a little big, they're wide and they're, sh and they're short genetically. And they put on weight easily. And some of these women, they're, they're real like thick, but they're, they're strong. And like they're moving all day. They have energy. They're super happy and they're healthy in their countenance and everything. So there, there are some different phenotypes out there in, uh, and different genetic expressions, I think. that uh, Yeah, so maybe, maybe some people are genetically more inclined to be overweight but healthy. I don't know. How, what are the Samoan people's lifespans like? Do they die young? No, I think they're normal, but I know, I do know that some people can be fat on the outside and thin on the inside, so their visceral fat is very low. That's that. Yeah, that's probably what I think we're seeing in some of these people, right? It's like they there's there's also there's an argument to be made of like fat storage also being protective, right? You see some people after traumatic 
uh, emotional or even physical event, they'll put on a bunch of weight. And I don't know, they, fat does have an immune system function, like an immune function. And it yeah. is not just this, it's not like it's dead tissue. Like fat is metabolically active. And it's communicating, communicates with hormones, communicates with enzymes, electricity. Uh, there's a lot of collagen and water that goes through fat as well. So there's not, I think this is something really interesting. That's a great question. I'd love to, uh, to explore some of these ideas more, but I don't know how you'd even experiment with, with some of this stuff. But the Samoans, they seem to eat a lot of like fish and roots. And do they eat a lot of imported foods too? They probably do now, but they've, I think yeah. just for a while, for years, they've been. But I feel like they're, they're like uh, New Zealand, the Maori also are, are kind of like, they're, they're husky. They're thick and they're strong, but they're not like that pathological fat where it's like the belly starts sticking out. It's like some, a lot of the women like in the community we live in, they're, they're like, they're big and they're thick, but it's like, you, like, they look like they could deadlift more than me. Right. They're like, Oh, like, <laughs> like you're like, you're really strong. Like, if you picked me up or like, they, like they'll pick up their kids. They're going to walk up the Hills. They're metabolically healthy, but they're thick, you know? So I think it's, um, that it's a fascinating thing. I don't think fat is necessarily bad. Like you said, visceral fat seems to be a major issue. Yeah. Fatty liver seems to be a major issue. And I would rather, all right. So just because I'm somebody who has gotten really skinny at times, right? Like I've, I've gotten really lean and I've had times where I wasn't able to digest many foods or I've had digestive issues where I lost weight that I didn't want to lose. Right. So I think it's beneficial to be able to carry a certain amount of body fat. And I think we get below a certain level of body fat. We're going to be putting ourselves at danger of chronic disease and of not being able to fight off infections and of, uh, you know, of wasting. So it's a delicate balance to be found. And there are probably people of, you know, like these Icelandic giants, like half Thor Bjornsson, right? Like that dude, like he's I mean, probably not, a, he's not a good example of health because he weighs like 400 pounds and he's a you know, strong man, uh, athlete. But some of these like Nordic types, like they're big dudes and they're very, very strong, metabolically healthy, but they carry around body fat. And I think for cold climates, it's obviously going to have its benefit, right? If you're going through stressful famine cycles, you need some body fat, um, but also the immune system requires body fat as well. So yeah, I think these are all um, questions that I wish I could answer, but th like, you know, we, <laughs> I don't really know how we could, uh, could explore some of this deeper. We don't have billions of dollars to fund studies, unfortunately. <laughs> That'd be nice. Unless you're, unless you got a, a mattress over there, full cash. Then unfortunately not. I wish. Well, yeah, I'm going to have to go now because, uh, I'm actually, I go to a, a German class because I'm relearning German. Nice. Oh, you, you learned German as a kid? Well, I was born in Switzerland in the German part and I grew up, yeah. I grew up for years in Germany, but I need a refresher. Andrew, it's, it's been nice uh, getting to talk with you, man. You always bring, you always bring some of the best questions and the, I think you and I are, uh, it, it's always nice connecting with you over the years, right? Because you really stoke my interest in a lot of things and you open up um new lines of questioning that that i want to explore and you uh, you clarify a lot of things too so thanks well, for uh, it's, it's been good to that. share because i've been improving over the years as well well like you you've also brought attention to other things too other treatments and i meant to mention this earlier but you know we, we've we've been all over um so many different subjects in this talk you mentioned nestle with the ketone product and then their other product <clears throat> for uh, putting on weight and increasing hunger. Um, but it's yeah, funny it's because both fortitude. of those could possibly be replaced by one natural product, <laughs> uh, yeah. which is illegal in many places. And that's cannabis. And this is something uh -huh. that I've seen you advocating for as well as more research into this. Uh, what's it looking like in the UK right now for cannabis research and for advocacy for patients? Well, there's, a, there's this amazing researcher that I've been in contact with since I was diagnosed in the UK called Dr. Wai Lu. He's got Chinese background, nice. uh, so it's difficult to say his name. <laughs> but he's, mm -hmm. he's, leading the, he's leading that research in this country, and he, yeah. he's, uh, a, he's, he's amazing. Just, but he, there's, 
there's resistance everywhere else so he's kind of like the only the only guy out there and just um the nhs has been very resistant to even accepting the evidence on it that it can help with epilepsy and all these other things but it's just, it's just it's very resistant it's a sticky situation double yeah. entendre there but there wow. is there is lots of research happening on it at St George's University Hospital um mm-hmm. but they're just quite quiet about it they have some really interesting case studies um particularly relating to blood cancers the cannabinoids um with this ratio of THC and CBD appear to actually have the biggest effect on blood cancers what's the ratio 1 to 1 uh yeah it's it's typically just above uh just above like like more like a two to one in favor of thc yeah that's interesting because a lot of the people were hyping cbd for a while but it seems like to kill cancer cells you need some thc yeah and it seems like just cbd doesn't even work that well for epilepsy and stuff too like you need the actual you need at least some thc in the right ratio and um yeah i tried i tried cbd on its own it had no beneficial effect on me it seems like the dosage you have to take to get any real effect, like anti-inflammatory noticeable effect from CBD seems to be way higher than what most people are dosing in the companies that are selling it. So yeah, unfortunately that market to me seems like it's full of opportunist marketers and not mm-hmm. as many really well, useful it, products. It, it's a trillion, it's a trillion dollar industry now. Just CBD. if you see how it just the, the cannabis based products in general, if you look yeah. at, how Canada is doing. There's so many of these startups that suddenly get very, very rich from <laughs> all these, these uh, medicinal. I think products. it might be. Yeah. I saw something recently though about there was like a way, a major overproduction of cannabis in the last couple of years in Canada. So, yeah. It's yeah. But we could, we could talk about this for, for hours, but um, I know you got to get going. It's been, yeah. <laughs> it's been real nice talking, man. I appreciate you having me on. And oh, it's I, been great. I'll do All right, man. Well, hey, thanks a lot for for reaching out and for for contacting me, man. It's always it's always a pleasure to talk to you, and uh, I'm honored to be on the show. And uh, I'm gonna be on with my day. Yeah, have That's a good great. night, and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening, man. Thanks. Have a good day. Later, Andrew.